Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Nā mihi nui ki a koutou, ko Anna Rawlings taka wingawa, ko o te tia mana o te komihana ta hokohoko. Good morning everybody, thank you uh, for being here this morning for the presentation of this, our uh, draft report into our third market study into residential building supplies. Uh, welcome to those of you joining us online this morning also. I'm Anna Rawlings, Chair of the Commerce Commission. For those of you I haven't met before, uh, with me today is also Commissioner Dr John Small, uh, who will join me after our presentation for uh, any questions you may have. As you know, uh, late last year, the government asked us to undertake a market study to look at whether competition in the supply and acquisition of residential building supplies was working well. Consistent with the terms of reference, we've uh, looked at factors that might be affecting competition um, in relation to the major components of residential buildings. And for those purposes, the major components of residential buildings are the foundation, the flooring, the roof, the walls, the structural and non-structural interior and exterior walls, and also insulation. That means that there are some building supplies that fall outside the scope of the study and those are uh, electrical and plumbing supplies. <clears throat> the study must include the list of things that you can see on the slide, but it can also include others. So we've considered the industry structure and the dynamics of competition at different levels of the supply chain in the industry. But we focus most strongly on the conditions for entry and expansion of competing products. These are the conditions that we consider are critical to facilitating workable competition for key building supplies. The terms of reference also require a broad sectoral scope for the study, and in this respect it differs a little from our studies into the fuel and grocery sectors. We identify in our report 18 categories of key building supplies with a number of supplies within each of those categories. Each category roughly resembles its own market with its own set of suppliers and its own co competition dynamics. In some preliminary papers that we issued early in the study, uh, we identify our approach to taking that uh, wider sectoral view. Those papers explained that we were concentrating on factors affecting competition for all key building supplies, but also that we were undertaking three detailed case studies into plasterboard, structural timber and ready mix concrete, including cement as part of the study. The two approaches are mutually reinforcing. The case studies have assisted us to more closely consider factors affecting competition for the supply and acquisition of all key building supplies, um, but they've enabled us to make some observations that support those findings, whilst also looking at how the factors affecting competition uh, apply to a greater or lesser extent in respect of some examples. The case studies haven't narrowed the scope of the study as a whole, um, neither are they mini market studies into three supplies though either. Our focus has remained as the terms of reference requires of us uh, on the competition dynamics at play across the industry as a whole. So far in the study we've undertaken a range of research and spoken to a number of parties. Uh, we also held a Māori hui. Uh, and we look forward to continuing to engage with all those stakeholders with whom we've already spoken and others who would like to contribute to the study as we work towards our final report in December of this year. It won't be lost on many of you uh, that the industry has been changing dramatically over the periods that we've been undertaking the study. There are a number of unique and dynamic characteristics at play and we've accommodated these in our work to the extent that we can. This was always expected. We've seen sharp spikes in demand and global supply issues, as well as some product shortages during the pandemic, and this is continuing. We've considered some of these issues to the extent that they affect the resilience of the industry as a whole, and that is relevant to whether competition is working well over the longer term. However, we haven't closely examined factors uh, relating to the international supply chain or the short-term effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. Many of you might also be aware that there are a number of government initiatives ongoing in relation to this industry. These include the government's recently announced review into the building consent system, and that review in particular identifies many issues that also arose in the course of our study so far. 
Recent actions have also been taken in relation to shortages in the supply of plasterboard, including the issue by MB of guidance relating to substitution and the government appointment of a ministerial task force. Those initiatives all relate to construction or building or building supplies. They each have a different focus from our study, which is focused on competition. But there are also many complementarities, particularly between our preliminary findings and draft recommendations and the focus expected in the review of the building consent system. Many potential changes arising from these initiatives, we believe, that target the building regulatory system will also improve competition and further contribute to the shared objectives of delivering safe, healthy, durable, affordable homes to New Zealanders. We've sought to draw parallels between these areas of work uh, where we can and where relevant, and we've had close regard to the relationship between our work and the work of those programmes. We expect that some of our draft recommendations may be considered for further work uh, through those initiatives. And now to the industry. We've considered the range of industry participants who play significant roles in the construction process for residential buildings. These include designers who prepare plans and specify the building supplies to be used, architects uh, primarily, builders, building firms um, who construct residential buildings, building consent authorities who are accredited and registered to issue and assess compliance with building consents. Most key building supplies are distributed to builders through merchants. There are five building supplies merchants with a nationwide presence, and those are Bunnings, Carters, ITM, Mitre 10 and Placemakers. In addition to this, there are several smaller merchants and retailers with a varying presence across the motu, carrying varying product ranges. The key building supplies sold by merchants are manufactured or imported by suppliers. Uh, some suppliers specialise in one product category only, and others supply products across a number of product categories. Some key building supplies tend to be sold more directly from the supplier uh, to builders and bypass the merchant or retail uh, and trade channels. We also observe that there is a culture of building bespoke homes in New Zealand. The majority of residential houses are built to, by small to medium sized builders, although the proportion of houses that are being built by larger scale builders is growing in, in our observation. It appears that there is a strong homeowner preference for bespoke housing, more so than for standardised designs, um, but we've also heard that this reflects what is predominantly available in New Zealand markets and that the real priority for many homeowners and end consumers in their whānau is acquiring warm, dry, durable and affordable housing. These are the objectives also of the building regulatory system and also of competition itself. Against this industry uh, co and operating context, we've reached the preliminary view that competition in the supply of key building supplies is not working as well as it could and it would be improved if it was easier for competing building supplies to be introduced and to expand in relevant markets. The solution, we believe, lies in improving the conditions for entry and expansion, which in turn will improve competition. If competition was more effective, it would work with the regulatory system to deliver those safe, healthy, durable and affordable homes that New Zealanders are looking for. There are few competing suppliers in many of the categories of key building supplies uh, that we've looked at. And this appears to be because features of the regulatory system are making it difficult for key building supplies to enter and expand to compete in those categories. And the regulatory system also incentivises designers, builders and building consent authorities as well to favour tried and tested building products over new or competing products because their compliance is more readily assured. And finally, some types of rebates that we've observed used by some suppliers appear to be reinforcing the barriers to distributing competing products in some product markets. As in previous studies, we've also observed that at the merchant level, restrictive land covenants and exclusive leases are benefiting merchants to some degree, and we've identified some areas of further work for the Commerce Commission using its compliance and enforcement functions and powers, and that work is ongoing. I'll discuss each of these in a little uh, more detail. 
and then talk about our draft recommendations. First, the regulatory system. The building sector is governed by a regulatory system which has at its heart uh, the provision of durable and safe homes for New Zealanders. But it has a number of features that prevent competition from working well, in our view. Despite the flexibility to use new products, which is built into the system, it's too slow and costly and uncertain to get them accepted for general use. This is due to the combined effects, as I've said, in the way that the regulatory and standard systems operate, and also the choices that designers and builders and building consent authorities make when they're applying the regulatory and standard systems. The building code and associated systems are complex to navigate. There are relatively few streamlined and clear compliance pathways for building products, and promoting competition is not a clear or express objective within the building system. Where requirements or standards reflect, reflect a particular New Zealand perspective, this can make it difficult for imported products to enter New Zealand markets. And we've also heard that building consent authorities are reluctant to approve the use of products with which they're unfamiliar. The behaviours of designers and builders and BCAs appear mutually reinforcing. Designers and builders anticipate what the building consent authorities might think about the products they propose to use, and they generally choose the path of least resistance when specifying and purchasing key building supplies. It takes significant time and additional cost and some delay to choose alternatives in many cases. This creates a cycle which in our view reinforces the use of tried and tested products and this appears to be a long term feature of the industry depicted in this uh, diagram. It also means that merchants tend to stock the products that people are looking for, those are the tried and tested products and because those products are specified in plans and consented, they are the ones that they prefer to stock and they are the products that are sought after by builders. And to that extent, this cycle also affects competition at the merchant level. Some types of rebates paid uh, by some, some suppliers to merchants appear to reinforce these regulatory impediments to entry and expansion for competing products and suppliers. Rebates between suppliers and merchants are generally widespread for some key building supplies and they can be of significant value and their structures vary. They can provide real benefits in this industry and across many other commercial contexts as well. For example, rebates can provide a way for suppliers to pass through lower costs and lower prices for higher volumes to their customers. But quantity forcing rebates reward merchants for purchasing greater volumes through a single supplier, and they do that by offering a higher percentage rebate the more a merchant buys. And they apply the rebate across all of a merchant's purchases, not just the additional purchase in the tier of rebate at issue. Some of them apply retrospectively, um, and merchants are incentivised, therefore, to keep on buying from a merchant so that the price of all their purchases, past and present, reduces as their volume purchased increases. These kinds of rebates can deter merchants from stocking competing products in their stores. It makes it more difficult for new or smaller suppliers of products to get established in the market. And this is especially the case when they're used by suppliers with significant market shares. In our preliminary view, they can reinforce the impediments that I've talked about that are provided by the regulatory system, making it difficult for some products to enter markets or to expand to access distribution channels and increase their sales volumes. Those are our two key areas of findings, but we've made some other preliminary findings that I briefly mentioned earlier. At the merchant level, competition is working relatively well across Aotearoa New Zealand. However, merchants are benefiting from the use of restrictive covenants and exclusive leases of the kind that we've also seen in the fuel and grocery sectors. We haven't reviewed covenants and leases in detail in this market study, but we know that generally speaking, they affect competition at the retail level. Independent of this study, we're taking enforcement action in relation to a restrictive land covenant in this sector, and this work predates this market study. Alongside the rebates that I've discussed and this pre-existing enforcement action, we've also identified some other types of strategic business conduct uh, that we are continuing to follow up, 
using our uh, Commission uh, compliance and enforcement functions under the Commerce Act. This includes activity relating to suppliers allocating stock to customers during recent shortages and also to some pricing practices and we're looking to obtain further information in relation to both of those. Finally, we've looked at business structure in some cases and we're aware that this has at times been the subject of discussion in public commentary. Specifically, we've been looking at the operation of some businesses who function at different levels of the supply chain, referred to as vertically integrated businesses. Two of the five main merchants in Aotearoa, New Zealand are vertically integrated. Vertical integration can affect competition if those vertically integrated suppliers can make it difficult for other merchants to access their supplies. Or if the merchant or the retail arm of their business uh, won't stock the products of competing suppliers. At this stage, we don't consider that vertical integration is a factor affecting competition between suppliers and merchants over the longer term. Now I'll talk a bit about our draft recommendations um, directed at addressing the issues that we've identified. Our draft recommendations fall into three interdependent groups. That reflects the combination of regulatory, behavioural and strategic impediments to competition that we've identified. All of our recommendations, of course, are subject to further consultation at this stage and they may change as we work towards our final report in December. Our draft recommendations include a range of measures that are designed to enhance the regulatory system that I've discussed, support sound decision making within that regulatory system <clears throat> and address strategic business conduct. And I'll talk through each in a little more detail. The first suite of recommendations is directed at enhancing the regulatory system. Our first recommendation is to introduce competition as an express objective to be promoted within the building regulatory system. Ensuring that the system continues to deliver quality housing for New Zealanders is critical. But to ensure the effective operation of markets to deliver that housing to New Zealanders, we consider that competition needs to take a prominent place in the regulatory system and in its decision making. We recommend that promoting competition as a core objective of the building regulatory system alongside its other important objectives is an essential recommendation. Our second recommendation is to better reflect a Māori perspective in the building regulatory system. We've heard a range of views through engagement with Māori so far in this study about the challenges encountered uh, with consenting, with rising building costs and with supply chain disruption. We also heard how the building consent system doesn't adequately respond to the unique needs and aspirations of Māori and the way that they would like to choose to build. Better engagement is key to achieving their objectives and aspirations. It requires flexibility around the way that Māori choose to use and also in relation to the way that building consent authorities engage. This is also reflected in the discussion paper recently issued in relation to the building consent review and we agree that it is an objective that should be pursued more broadly across the building regulatory system. Our third recommendation is to create more compliance pathways for a broader range of key building supplies. The objective of a performance-based building regulatory system such as we have is to enable designers and builders to meet the requirements of the building code in flexible and efficient ways. But despite, despite some flexibility, as I've said, uh, the building regulatory system seems to continue to incentivise the use of tried and tested uh, products over new and competing products. Consenting costs could be reduced and choice and innovation and competition could be increased by creating more compliance pathways for a broader range of key building supplies. And we've identified a range of approaches that we consider uh, should be looked at and those include updating and developing more acceptable solutions and verification methods, the smoothest ways through to compliance. Enabling international bodies uh, to certify products as compliant with the New Zealand Building Code potentially, and developing guidance for key building supplies that identifies the appropriate building code clauses and the possible means of providing compliance with those clauses. 
A fourth recommendation is to explore more ways to remove impediments to product substitution and the need for consent variations for minor changes to building design. And this includes exploring ways to reduce the specification of products by brand, which tends to exacerbate uh, the use of, of uh, specific products that we've identified. The second area is in increasing the flexibility in the multi-proof scheme, which is a scheme which currently speeds up consenting for standardised designs. Making a pro appropriate product substitution easier would prompt more consideration of competing building supplies and, in our view, uh, increase switching between products and improve competition. Our fifth recommendation is to investigate uh, whether the barriers to certification and appraisal of building products can be reduced. Again, we've identified two possible approaches here for further consideration. The first is reviewing the cost structures that apply to accreditation schemes or introducing a streamlined certification process. And perhaps also through government directly contributing to the cost of certification and assurance bodies or reviewing the cost structures of accreditation schemes to make it easier for suppliers of new innovative competing products uh, to have their products approved for uh, travel through the compliance pathway and use in markets. The second suite of recommendations that we've made are directed at supporting sound decision making within the regulatory system. It involves identifying and developing methods to centralise information sharing about key building supplies. And we recommend two complementary initiatives here that could be used to increase the confidence and trust in building products, particularly as new and innovative products are developed and employed for use in New Zealand. The first is to establish a National Building Products Register as a centralised repository for sharing of information about building products and consenting processes, processes. It would include not just specifications about products, but information about where they've been used and how they've been approved for use uh, in their intended use. This is because there is currently no single centralised repository for information of this kind. It means it can be difficult to find information about products and the basis upon which they've been granted consent, and often that information is intermingled with marketing information provided by suppliers, and difficult to assess uh, and compare with other information. The second initiative we recommend is to establish a Building Consent Authority Centre of Excellence that would facilitate greater information sharing between building consent authorities about their consenting and approval processes. And the aim here would be to ensure that building consent authority staff apply an appropriate level of scrutiny to consent applications, but they also have access to a greater knowledge base when doing so. A perception of risk aversion and of questions relating uh, re to liability uh, for building consent authorities were also raised during our study and have been a theme raised also in respect of the uh, review of the building consent system. We haven't made recommendations relating to these issues because they've been considered in some depth uh, by MB in preparation for the discussion paper for that review, and government has released uh, policy statements in relation to them. Nevertheless, we emphasise that where uh, there is cons further consideration of competition as an objective in the redesign of aspects of the building regulatory system, those competition impacts should also be considered. Finally, uh, we make some recommendations relating to addressing strategic business conduct. These aim to discourage conduct that can harm competition and ensure that the new rules about the misuse of market power in particular are understood and are appropriately addressed as we move into 2023. So our first recommendation under this suite is to promote compliance with the Commerce Act, including by discouraging the use of quantity forcing supplier to merchant rebates in some circumstances. I've talked at length about rebates already, and our preliminary view is that because they can be pro-competitive in many circumstances and are widely used, legislative changes to specifically prohibit their use is likely to be unjustified. But in some circumstances, they can breach the Commerce Act, at the moment, if they are used by businesses with a substantial degree of market power for the purpose of excluding competition, they could breach the Act. But from April next year, it will be enough that they have the effect of substantially lessening competition in relevant markets. 
and we intend to conduct a comprehensive compliance program to promote closer assessment of rebates for compliance with those new provisions of the Commerce Act. This work will complement our standard guidance that we issue when the law changes. And we also can continue to consider some information that we have collected during the study relating to rebates. And we will consider whether that information uh, leads us to conclude that further action is required uh, using either our compliance powers that I've talked about or enforcement powers. Finally, we recommend further consideration of the use of land covenants and exclusive leases. This is the third consecutive market study in which we've seen restrictive land covenants being used on a widespread basis and potentially impacting competition. Restrictive covenants and exclusive leases are likely to reduce merchants' ability to access suitable sites and they may hinder and raise the cost of entry and expansion. In this study, we've seen a third type of covenant that we're continuing to look into, which requires the, the builder uh, building on a, on a piece of land to access building supplies from a particular merchant and that's something we're inquiring into further. It may well be the case that a multi-sectoral approach to covenants is required and further research could inform that decision. So we make a draft recommendation that an economy-wide review be commissioned to consider the impact on competition of the use of land covenants and exclusive leases across the economy and to consider whether a multi-sectoral solution is required. And this would need to factor in uh, heavily matters relating to uh, land use and land law. That concludes the recommendations uh, that we make in our draft report. Our next steps uh, are to um, invite submissions from parties on the draft report and we really want to hear from anybody that we've heard from already with comments and new information about the matters that we've raised. But we also continue to invite submissions from those with whom we haven't yet engaged over the coming months. We also will hold a consultation conference to discuss issues arising in the draft report uh, in the last week of September and then we'll take further submissions and our final report is scheduled to be delivered on the 6th of December this year. I'll invite uh, Dr Small to join me and uh, any questions that you have. Um, that looks like, is that a shorter time frame? You've got the draft report coming out today and it's about four months, final report. Is that a shorter time frame than the other uh, market studies? And it, it's a shorter time frame than the groceries market study, which you might recall uh, had an extended time frame to accommodate difficulties experienced in Auckland with the extended lockdown. But the time frames uh, fairly well match the time frames uh, for the fuel market study. Uh, you mentioned that there um, were some cases where, where rebates might, might already be breaching the, the Commerce Act. Are you uh, ready to take prosecutions in those cases? And in general, uh, through your investigation, have you found uh, breaches of existing legislation which you're, which you're now ready to pursue? So we're continuing to assess the information that we have uh, and we'll do that in the next uh, few months and that will include considering whether further action is required. What we're really looking for people to focus on though is this law change that comes in in April 2023. So for a long time the Commission has supported amendment to the Commerce Act to provide that a misuse of a substantial degree of market power with the effect of a substantial lessening of competition would breach the Act, rather than needing to establish that the intention or purpose of that conduct uh, was to affect competition. So we've long said uh, that we consider there are cases that could be more readily brought under an effects test than a purpose test. Uh, the conduct needs to have occurred after the new law comes into force. Uh, so that's why we're focused in a compliance setting on encouraging anybody who is using rebates to consider their compliance with the Commerce Act also in recognition that not all rebating structures will breach the Commerce Act and many can in fact be pro-competitive. Maybe consumers will assume that when they see the price of a building product on, on, the, on an invoice from their builder, that that's not really the price that the builder paid. 
you know, noting the, the, the extensive use of sort of rebates and discounts in the industry. Is, is there ever an excuse for, for an organisation or a business to, to put a price on an invoice for something that they've bought that doesn't reflect the actual payment that they made? Is, is that a practice that needs to stop? Well, the rebates that I've been discussing this morning are focused in the supplier to merchant area. And uh, we've also collected some information in relation to rebates paid by merchants to builders. But we understand them to be uh, less prevalent and less of an, of an issue. So we are inviting further information about those kinds of rebates if people have that information to provide to us. In relation to what builders are representing to their consumers to be the price of a product, uh, we'd encourage builders to think about um, the truthfulness of those representations and also um, and, and whether they are in fact at risk of breaching the Fair Trading Act if they're misrepresenting the price that they're paying for a product. I guess that question stands. I mean, if, if you put up a price on an invoice for, for something that you bought, whether you're a, a builder or a merchant or anywhere in the supply chain, should it reflect the actual price that you paid, or, or is it okay to, I guess, disguise the use of discounts and rebates that you may have received? Rebate structures vary widely, and I think it really depends on the on the circumstances. But we would expect customers to be told, if they're being told the price paid for a product, it should be the price paid for the product. Um. COVID-19 pressures weren't part of this, but obviously they're playing a significant part in these struggles and pinches that we are seeing in this market already. What, was there any consideration into adding COVID-19 pressures into this, or was it just a blanket, wasn't in the, in the um, remit to begin with? Oh no, it was, we, we certainly... Uh, took account of the disruptions associated with COVID-19 and that, that's, that's obviously been, um, it's revealed an, uh, an amount of information to us, right? But um, the, the study itself is about um, more longer term uh, issues related to competition. So that's, it's interest that, 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 that um, the, the facts and the disruptions are, which are, have been terrible uh, and, and very costly um, are, are, are they, they tell us some things about how the markets are working, and, they, and they've been so we've factored them into that account. What we have, what we conclude and indicate in the report is that if you had a higher degree of competition in some of these markets and markets for some products, uh, then those markets would be more resilient to the kinds of shocks that have we've seen with uh, COVID-19 supply shortages. So generally, it hasn't been necessary to look specifically into the effect of COVID-19 because what we see is that many of these markets are highly concentrated and uh, if there was more competition, they'd be more resilient to uh, shocks like, like the pandemic uh, or other supply supply shocks that you might experience from time to time. So if we had more competition, potentially this jib crisis that we're seeing might, may or may not have happened? Well, I think uh, what we can see from the Ministerial Task Force into Plasterboard, which is still uh, ongoing and we're not privy to all of the information about, about what's happening in that task force, but what we can see is that there are some initiatives being employed already that appear uh, to us to be a good example of what is possible when the regulatory system is addressed to enable the entry and the, the better enable the entry and use of competing products. And, uh, and so it actually provides a real-time example uh, of what the recommendations that we're making in relation to the regulatory system in particular can achieve. Have you had any second thoughts as to whether you should have included plumbing and electrical in the scope of uh, the report that you've done? No, we haven't. Uh, we covered that in our preliminary issues paper and in discussion and submissions at the time. Uh, those products are subject to further regulatory requirements of their own and uh, we think that the, the study has been scoped appropriately for the work that's required in the time that we've uh, had to, to look at those 18 categories of key building supplies that we specified. And the legislation recently passed on land covenants uh, applying to uh, supermarkets, is that applicable perhaps in some instances to the sort of covenants that you've discussed here? It's the same sort of covenants, and in many cases it's the same type of covenants, but what we're saying here is that this is you know, the third time that we've um, investigated industries and found the same kinds of covenants at work having broadly similar effects, and that's why we're suggesting 
that we need something that's perhaps uh, a little more broad than one sector at a time. So um, we're, we're suggesting that some work be done on uh, whether there's an economy-wide solution that's required here, because this does seem to be quite widespread. Would not be at all surprised to see it in other sectors other than the three we've found it. You have instances in the research that you did that showed that these covenants had actually limited competition in this sector? What we've concluded is that uh, competition at a national level between merchants is working relatively well and we've focused on uh, that supplier and product entry and expansion issue um, because that's where we think the issue really lies in the regulatory system here. Um, as I said, we do have one case in this sector that we've been investigating uh, where we will bring proceedings this year and um, consistent with the use of our enforcement discretion across all of the work that we do. Um, we don't bring cases in relation to every um, example necessarily, but, um, but we have that one enforcement case on foot. Here we haven't delved deeply into the effects of specific covenants because we think competition between merchants is working reasonably well. And for the reasons uh, John has explained, uh, we think that rather than going sector by sector, given this is the third time that we've seen them, a wider review of the use of covenants across the economy is um, a better approach at this stage. You, you mentioned the the issue uh, of sort of that a lot of houses were new houses were being built uh, bespoke by, by by small builders uh, uh, and sort of low you know low volume. Like, is, is how much do you think that is unnecessarily increasing the cost of new housing? And is there anything in the recommendations that you've released today that will, could sort of address that issue, or do you see other opportunities for other entities to sort of tackle that? Yeah, yes, there's, there's, um, there's quite a lot in the report about um, new and innovative building methods. Um, ultimately, I mean, these things are a matter of, to an extent of consumer preferences. If people really want a house built in a, in a, in a particular non-standard way, then, you know, that's, that's, that's their right. Um, but we, we are concerned about um, the, the extent, uh, the, the competitive um, position of uh, new and innovative building methods and products. A good example is panelisation and off-site manufacturing, which we talk about quite a bit in the report. Um, so these are ways of potentially building in a more efficient fashion, um, lower cost, more standardisation, um, and those, those methods face not exactly the same barriers as other as particular building products, but very similar. Uh, so the recommendations this is one of the advantages of looking broadly uh, across the sector, uh, is that you know, a panelisation operation or an off-site manufacturing business that produces whole houses, that involves multiple products, um, each one of which has got a potentially an issue. So yeah, that is, that is covered in Chapter 8 of the report. We also are talking the recommendations about the multi-proof system, which is a, a system that enables um, a compliance pathway for standardised building. But uh, what we've recommended is that that's looked at to make it easier to institute minor variations so that you don't find yourself back in the normal consenting system uh, to vary those, um, so you don't void the multi-proof and end up back in the consenting system for those variations to those standardised designs uh, where the impact may be less. So uh, these are issues that we're identifying for those who are technical experts in that area to uh, have a look at. But we do believe that when competition is working better, it has an impact on the delivery of quality housing for New Zealanders and it should impact the cost of housing as well, in our view. Nothing else? Well, thank you very much, everybody. Look forward to seeing you at the end of the year. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs>